The following is an encore presentation of Everything Everywhere Daily. In the late 19th century, several of the world's foremost inventors engaged in a public battle for the future of electricity. The battle was fought in boardrooms and newspapers, and there was seemingly nothing that was off limits. The battle eventually took the lives of several people and several dogs. Learn more about the current wars between George Westinghouse, Nikolai Tesla, and Thomas Edison on this episode of Everything Everywhere Daily. This episode is sponsored by Heaven Hill Bottled and Bond Bourbon. I recently had the chance to try Heaven Hill Bottled and Bond, and I can attest to its exceptional aromas with hints of caramel and vanilla intertwining with its oakiness, which provide a well-rounded flavor profile. Taking a sip is akin to experiencing a piece of bourbon history firsthand. Heaven Hill Distillery may be America's most quintessential bourbon distillery. Established in 1935 after the end of Prohibition, the distillery was established by the Shapira family and has remained a family-owned distillery to this day. In 1897, Congress passed the Bottled in Bond Act, which set forth strict rules for any bourbon labeled Bottled in Bond. Heaven Hill Bottled in Bond bourbon goes beyond the stringent requirements of the law by aging its bourbon for seven years, not four. The end result is a gold medal-winning bourbon that truly stands out. Available nationally, look for a bottle at your local store. Heaven Hill Bottled in Bond. Heaven Hill reminds you, think wisely, drink wisely. This episode is sponsored by Newspapers.com, your passport to untold stories and hidden histories. As the largest online newspaper archive, Newspapers.com offers an incredible journey through time, with papers dating back to 1690. Imagine exploring the news, events, and everyday moments that shape the history of the world around us. Newspapers.com puts over 900 million pages at your fingertips, offering a front row seat to the past. With papers from the United States, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and beyond, Newspapers.com lets you walk the streets of history, whether it's London during the Blitz, New York during Prohibition, or Sydney during the construction of the Harbor Bridge. For listeners of today's episode, Newspapers.com is extending a special offer. Use the code EVERYTHING EVERYWHERE and enjoy a 20% discount on a subscription. That's EVERYTHING EVERYWHERE at Newspapers.com. It's the perfect way to unlock the world of history. Standards are really important. If everyone has a standard way of doing something, it usually will make things easier for everyone. Even if the standard which is chosen isn't necessarily the best, some standard is usually better than nothing. We have a standard for how to communicate on the internet and how to listen to podcasts as well as many other things. In the late 19th century, it was becoming clear that electricity was going to be the next big thing and that it had the potential to revolutionize the world. However, as electricity became more developed, a problem began to arise. There were two competing methods for the transmission of electricity. Alternating current and direct current. Direct current is an electrical current that only goes in one direction. If you hook up a battery to a small light bulb, that's a direct current. A direct current is very simple, and the first electrical currents were all direct currents. Direct current is usually called DC. Alternating current is an electrical current where the direction and magnitude of the current constantly changes direction. Alternating current goes by AC. These two methods of transmitting electricity are mutually exclusive. You can do one or the other, but you can't do them both over the same wire. The story starts with Thomas Edison. If you remember back to my episode on the invention of the light bulb, Edison didn't exactly invent the light bulb, but he did create the first workable system for electric lighting. He also had a working electric motor that could convert electricity to physical motion, which could be used in manufacturing. Basically, everything which Edison had which used electricity used direct current. Moreover, Edison was a big advocate of direct current, and he thought it was what the future of electrification would be built upon. Alternating current had been known for several decades. While direct current is the output of a battery, alternating current is the product of a spinning electric dynamo. One of the major benefits of DC back in the early 1880s was that there were no electric motors that could use AC power at that time. That was until a young Croatian engineer who worked for Thomas Edison by the name of Nikolai Tesla pitched him on the idea of an AC electric motor in 1884. This was actually a major breakthrough. 
it totally changed what type of current could be used for one of the most important applications of electricity. However, when Tesla tried to pitch the idea to Edison, he wasn't interested. Edison believed the future was DC, and he was willing to stake the future of Edison Electric on it. Tesla thought that the future belonged to AC. The main reason for this was that AC was the current produced by an electrical generator, and AC could travel much further along a wire than DC could. In fact, this was the big problem with direct current. Direct current can only travel a few miles along a wire. Edison's early systems had generators of very close to where the electricity was ultimately used. Tesla quit working for Edison after only six months, and he went to get several patents for devices using alternating current. Tesla's ideas were brilliant, but he wasn't able to bring his inventions to the market on his own. He needed an organization, and he needed money. He found that in the person of George Westinghouse. Westinghouse was an industrialist and the inventor of the railway air brake. He was also one of the foremost manufacturers of electrical components and equipment at the time, and a direct competitor of Edison. Westinghouse was a big believer in alternating power and entered the AC power business in 1885. He was very technically literate and had read all the literature on AC power and the newly developed transformers. Transformers can step the voltage up or down of an electrical current. Westinghouse realized that a system running on AC could scale far better than one running on DC. He could build large-scale electrical plants and transmit the electricity over long distances, as opposed to Edison's system, which required many smaller power plants transmitting electricity over shorter distances. Westinghouse's AC systems were quickly expanding into areas that already had Edison systems, and moreover, they were gaining in popularity. Edison needed to fight back if his DC system was to remain relevant. The way he fought back was in the court of public opinion. While AC power could be sent over longer distances, it had to be done at higher voltages. Edison tried to smear AC power as being dangerous. Edison began by just making public pronouncements about Westinghouse and alternating current. In 1886, he said, quote, Just as certain as death, Westinghouse will kill a customer within six months after he puts in a system of any size. He's got a new thing and it will require a great deal of experimenting to get it working practically. End quote. Edison then began to step up his efforts to discredit direct current. In 1888, the state of New York was looking for a more humane method of execution. Edison, who had been opposed to the death penalty his whole life, suggested the use of electricity as a means of execution. In particular, execution by high-voltage alternating current. He suggested it because he wanted to associate alternating current with death. In particular, he recommended, quote, alternating machines manufactured principally in this country by George Westinghouse. Also in 1888, an engineer by the name of Harold Brown began writing about the dangers of alternating current in the New York Post. He wrote, quote, the only excuse for the use of the fatal alternating current is that it saves the company operating it from spending a larger sum of money for the heavier copper wires which are required by the safe incandescent systems. That is, the public must submit to constant danger from sudden death in order that a corporation may pay a little larger dividend. End quote. As far as we know, he had no prior association with Edison. He just did this all on his own. He then went far beyond letter writing, however. He hired local children to collect stray dogs and then began doing experiments electrocuting them. He presented his findings in a public demonstration at Columbia University, where he electrocuted one dog with a thousand volts of direct current, which lived. He then electrocuted another dog with 300 volts of alternating current, which died. The spectators supposedly were horrified and begged him to stop. During this time, Westinghouse was buying as much of the competition as he could and anything associated with alternating current. It was just after the Harold Brown demonstrations, he purchased the patents of Nikolai Tesla for a significant amount of money. Edison's recommendation for using AC for execution still hadn't been implemented. Officials with the state of New York discounted the demonstrations done by Harold Brown electrocuting dogs because they were so much smaller than a human. In December of 1888, Brown rented out space at Edison's New Jersey laboratory to put on an event for the media. There, he electrocuted three calves and a horse to demonstrate the lethality of alternating current. The state agreed to use alternating current for their executions, but Westinghouse didn't want to sell them any generators. Edison and Brown managed to acquire some for the state anyhow. 1889 saw more panic about alternating current. A Western Union lineman in New York City named John Feeks 
died when he was electrocuted by high voltage electrical wires when he's supposed to have been working on the low voltage telegraph wires. This started what became known as the electric wire panic. People in New York were afraid that the wires over their heads were going to kill them, and the newspapers began calling for executives from alternating current companies to be charged with manslaughter. In August of 1890, William Kemmler became the first person to be executed via electric chair. He was given a 17-second current of 1,300 volts of alternating current electricity. But he didn't die, despite all of the promises from Thomas Edison. He was then given a second jolt of 2,000 volts and finally died, and his body caught on fire. Despite Edison finally getting his wish of an execution by alternating current, the current wars pretty much died by 1890. In 1889, Edison had lost control of Edison General Electric, and by 1890, his own subsidiaries were building AC equipment. Moreover, several years earlier, an internal memo at Edison Labs recommended switching to AC power, but it was rejected by Edison personally, who was on his direct current crusade. In the end, the economic advantages of alternating current power were simply overwhelming. In 1892, Westinghouse got the bid for the World's Fair in Chicago, and it went off without a hitch, showing the world that AC could be safe. This helped Westinghouse win the bid for the Niagara Power Station, which was the biggest in the world at that point. And the transmission lines that were going out of the station were built by Edison's General Electric. Today, pretty much everything is alternating current. Sure, it's dangerous to touch an electrical wire, but don't do that. The entire grid from the generator to our homes is all carrying alternating current. Direct current is still in use, however, particularly in computers. That brick attached to your laptop is what converts alternating current to direct current. Same with your smartphone or anything which uses a battery. While the result of the War of the Currents was sort of predestined, the world would be a very different place if Edison had gotten his way. We'd all be living in a world with coal fire generators every few miles. The executive producer of Everything Everywhere Daily is Charles Daniel. The associate producers are Benji Long and Cameron Kiever. I want to give a big shout out to everyone who supports the show over on Patreon, including the show's producers. Your support helps me put out a show every single day. And also, Patreon is currently the only place where Everything Everywhere Daily merchandise is available to the top tier of supporters. If you'd like to talk to other listeners of the show and members of the Completionist Club, you can join the Everything Everywhere Daily Facebook group or Discord server. Links to everything are in the show notes.